Okay, so um, so we now have today uh, Raoul Angulo. So uh, uh, Raoul has done uh, his uh, PhD in Durham in 2009, and uh, and then you've been uh, at uh, MPA Garching uh, in Stanford. Then after, and uh, you've been staff in in Sefka, uh, in Spain, and now you're at uh, the Basque Foundation for Science in San Sebastian since 2017. Uh, so uh, Raoul is uh, an expert on. Uh, on numerical cosmology uh, by using uh, dark matter uh, cosmological simulations. Uh, you worked a lot on, on the statistical properties of uh, large scale structures, including dark matter halos, the, the properties of halos and their structures. And, uh, and uh, you're also an, an expert on galaxy formation. So you worked with the uh, Millennium XXL uh, simulation, if I'm correct, uh, so a huge project. Uh, of a large end body simulation, and uh, you also uh, uh, developed a, a new framework with uh, with collaborators on uh, on uh, simulating dark matter uh, uh, cosmological simulation with a, a Vlasov like uh, solver. Uh, and uh, and today you will talk about uh, how using uh, numerical simulation for uh, for uh, interpreting the, the the large survey. If I understand correctly, so the floor is yours. Please start. Oh, thank you, Johan. And, well, thanks for, for inviting me to give the, this talk. And yeah, I hope uh, I will be able to visit IEP soon in person. Um, yes, I'm going to present you the work I've been doing over the last couple of years together with uh, a group of uh, students and postdocs on, on how we can use um, numerical simulations of the universe to uh, derive cosmological constraints from, from observations. So this talk is about uh, cosmology and um, the basic thing that we want to do with cosmology is to, to understand the universe that is around us and, and the physics um, that uh, the, the, phys the laws of nature that uh, are present in the universe. So we have here, for instance, an image of the Hubble Big Field where, that shows all this diversity of galaxies with different shapes, colors, and and sizes, and uh, moreover, on the right, you see that these galaxies are not distributed randomly, but they have uh, all this cluster structure with uh, huge voids, filaments, and, and we want to understand uh, why the galaxies uh, follow these, uh, these patterns, uh, and then um, what we can learn about uh, fundamental laws of, of physics. So over the last, say, 20 years, uh, most of the information on cosmology have come from, from the cosmic microwave background radiation. And you know, I'm sure all of you are, are familiar with, with these measurements, for instance, from the Planck satellite that have measured the, the clustering of, um, of light and, uh, and the well, temperature and isotropies and the polarization of, of these um, photons. And, uh, and the measurements are, are really, really precise. And, Equally important to the precise measurement is that the, these have a um, very precise theory to interpret uh, this data. Right? That is pretty much gravity, diffusion, and, and, and pressure. And, and you can see here that the measurements given by the symbols are very, very well described by the, by the theory. Here. That is the um, um, red line. So by comparing this data and theory, we know that, uh, for example, we need dark matter with a statistical significance of over 100 sigma. We, uh, we also can already infer properties of dark matter. We know that it cannot be too warm, otherwise we, this, uh, we would have seen this effect uh, in, the, in the CMB. And uh, this data has provided uh, values for um, the main parameters of, of describing the universe to a precision of about 1%. Um, so we, we thanks to, to, to these experiments, we have now uh, this uh, concordance uh, lambda CDM model that is, has essentially four main ingredients. One is the existence of dark matter, um, then also of dark energy, that's the dominant uh, no, energy contributor to the energy budget of the universe. Uh, we know that the, the re general relativity is the is the is compatible with. Uh, with the, the gravitational effects that we see, and is the dominant force on, on large scales, and that and the primordial fluctuations are compatible with an inflationary epoch. And this lambda CDM picture is supported not only by the CMB, but by a multiple other experiments like gravitational lensing, the distribution of galaxies, or the absorption of um, uh, from from the light of high redshift quasars. Right. So we have this, this 
this lambda CDM model that predicts very, very well and that explains very, very well the structure uh, of the universe, right? At different scales, epochs, and so on and so on. But still, there are like fundamental questions associated to each of these four uh, pillars of lambda CDM. Um, so, with, with regards to the gravity law, uh, could be GR the, the correct gravity theory, but also there is still room for the departures from from GR, um, some modifications of of, um, uh, of the gravity law on large scales. We don't know whether it could be some Galilean or Petropar theory or the amplitude of, of these potential uh, scalar fields. Uh, the accelerated expansion is compatible with a cosmological constant, but there's also um, room for, for coup uh, coupling between dark energy and dark matter or a time dependent equation of state. Uh, similarly for dark matter, we, well, we know there should be roughly um, uh, collisionless and cold, but we still don't know exactly what the temperature should be or, or, or whether there could be quantum effects on, on macrophysical scales, on astrophysical scales, or, or we have not been down exactly the, the, the contribution of neutrinos to the, to the dark matter. And finally, for, for inflation, there are also op many fundamental open questions about you know, the properties of the field that drove this, this, inf this inflation. So the approach that we take in cosmology is to try to measure uh, the universe more and more precisely and measure the parameters more precisely, to try to detect a uh, crack in this, in this picture, uh, something that could um, rule out this simple lambda CDM scenario and that can hint to, to, to come one or to start to rule out or or uh, prefer one of these uh, explanations for, or more detailed explanations of, for these four aspects. But so far, um, uh, despite you know, increasing uh, statistical power, all these, uh, you know, the simplest Lambda CM scenario is compatible with all observations. Like curvature is still compatible with, with, a flat, uh, with zero, and neutrino masses are also, also compatible with, um, with zero, and, and, and so on. Um, right, but on the other hand, there's said to be some um, tensions uh, between uh, different data sets. Right? They're still at not super significant, but there are hints of it. And uh, these are the famous Hubble tension, where the um, early or measurements from the early universe prefers um, lower values of, of the Hubble parameter than uh, measurements from uh, Cepheids on, on also lensing on uh, at low regimes. And there's also the uh, tension with regards to this, the amplitude of, of the structure, how much cluster the, the, um, um, the universe is at, at low redshifts. So measurements from the CMB and Planck tend to predict a universe as much more clustered than what uh, is simply indicated by, by low redshift probes like clusters and, and lensing, right? So this is highlighted by these uh, blue points here. Still, this tension is at about one and a half and perhaps even two sigma. Um, so could be a statistical fluctuation or maybe uh, is pointing towards uh, uh, the first clear indication of physics beyond lambda CDM. So, um, right, but we, don't, we still don't know, right? Could be a new physics, could be model uh, errors in, your, um, uh, in, the, in the measurements or could be errors in the, in the data. Um, and the question is, how do we make progress, right? So on one hand, uh, even those CM, future CMB experiments could um, constrain better the, the values of these cosmological parameters, especially when you extend them beyond uh, lambda CDM. The most of the tension is between high redshift and low redshift universe. So, so much more um, could be gained by focusing uh, on, on measuring, measuring cosmology with, with the low redshift, and in particular with, with large scale structure. And this is the um, this is actually a, uh, something quite um, quite interesting because the distribution of, of not only of galaxies and dark matter but also of gas will give us access to, to several aspects of of, um, of fundamental aspects of the universe. Right? So so the clustering, the large scale structure depends on the amount of dark energy, of neutrinos, curvature, and so on. But it also depends on the initial conditions. Or what the, what was the universe like at a very early time? Right? So would be sensitive to primordial non Gaussianity and the in general right the shape and, and amplitude of, of the fluctuations, and and it's also sensitive to, to everything that happened in between. Right, uh, the structure is a consequence of uh, of the law of gravity, 
but also for galaxy formation and hydrodynamics. So we have this observable that's very, very rich and could give us um, a lot of information. And this is the opportunity that has been taken up by um, many, many different observational um, campaigns that's going to uh, deliver data in the next uh, decade. So Euclid, SKA, uh, WEAVE, LSST, and also new CMD experiments. And something quite exciting is that uh, all these experiments um, work in a complementary fashion. Right? Some of them will be focusing on lensing, others on, on clustering, on clusters. So we'll have different views of, of this universe. So, uh, so but the, the, from a theoretical point of view, um, the main question is like, how do we uh, extract the full power of all these all these measurements so we can uh, have a, you know, uh, a most comprehensive view of, of, of this low redshift, uh, high redshift um, uh, comparison. So, I mean, it's principle you say it's very simple. We have an observation and or an experiment. We just have to confront it with, with theory, right? So that's what the CMB has done, right? With linear perturbation theory compared to the, the observations and what, what has been done in science, right? Well, um, but the problem is that is the um, the theory for LSS is very very complicated. Right? So, so or in the CMB we had only linear theory essentially describing the the, the initial Gaussian uh, fluctuation. So it's a it's a it's physics that we know how to write and and solve very very accurately. But then as the universe evolves, gravity kicks in and very quickly nonlinearity is developed. Right. So, so we have the dark matter becomes uh, nonlinear. There's also the formation of bound structures. We call them dark matter halos. And the formation of these halos uh, is quite complicated. Maybe some stochastic terms depends on non-locally and, and depends on um, essentially the full history of, of structure growth. And on top of that, we have baryonic physics. Right. Uh, we know we can detect also galaxies, and that depends on on a lot of um, uh, astrophysical processes, and we typically also measure these galaxies in redshift space. So we also need to care about uh, velocities that in themselves are also uh, nonlinear, uh, maybe some stochastic, might be coupled with with gravity, with sorry, with astrophysics. And then there's also all, all the physics related to to the properties of the gas, the thermo thermodynamical properties of the gas, and also all the observational issues, so selection functions, and and so on that are uh, harder to do than, um, than uh, in CMB. So, so that means that, um, that we, we don't know how the, well, a theory for large scale structure does not exist, right? So we can uh, write a solution, a partial solution that is valid only on large scales under central, certain assumptions and that is what is usually done with, uh, with perturbation theory. But that means that we are losing a lot of uh, information. We are missing a huge opportunity for, for cosmology, right? And, and this is an example, right? This is how good the constraints on three different physics, right? On physics of inflation, the law of gravity or, or neutrino masses as a function of the amount of scales that we can interpret, right? So if you use linear perturbation theory, the same kind of framework used to interpret the CMB, that is normalized to one, but then if we are able to extend this to smaller scales, like what usually is aimed by uh, all the uh, development in perturbation theory, we get this green one. So we we do gain quite a lot, and and this is actually something in between is what is assumed, for instance, for for, for Euclid that what is assumed that Euclid will deliver. But if we are able to to access to these smaller scales, as shown in in um, in yellow here, we could have constraints that are 30 times stronger uh, for neutrino mass, right? This would correspond to a survey of roughly like a thousand times larger, right? So it's, um, it's a tough problem, right? So we, have, we know that there is a lot of information about the structures in the universe on, the, on, on, on these small, so small scales, um, but we don't have a theory how to, or, or we, we don't know how to extract all this, all this uh, information. So, Something I've been following, trying to push lately is that uh, even though we don't have a theory for large scale structure, uh, we we do have uh, quite accurate uh, simulation or modeling of the physics, right? That is something quite common that we do in, in several areas of science where we 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 compare observations and experiments with simulations and and, and modeling, and in particular in cosmology, um, simulation is is the most accurate way of of predicting what the universe should look like. So the, in a nutshell, what we do is take uh, fluctuations that are compatible with the CMB. Then we code up uh, simulated universes uh, 
and include all the physics that we think is relevant and solve them in these large supercomputers. And then we can predict the distribution of dark matter here, for instance, shown, right? So we have, you, know, you can really see that all the nonlinear features of filaments and so on, something that you could not predict with linear theory. Um, but also we, we can uh, uh, include uh, astrophysical processes to, to, to predict also distribution of gas and, and, and galaxies and so on. These are other, other examples of several simulations, the Horizon AGM, for instance, that uh, Johan was, was involved in. Um, uh, so yeah, so we can we can actually do use simulation to predict the, the universe, right? And it's actually it's a super super interesting topic because it involves um, a lot of different physics, right? So on large scales, we are dominated by general relativity and in general gravitational dynamics. But as we start uh, focusing on the smaller scales, there's also gravitational physics that determines the collapse of, of some fluctuations. And, and in these fluctuations, um, there will be accretion of gas and cooling, and, and this gas eventually is going to fragment and form stars and, and galaxies. And then this, 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 they are going to merge and going to you know, evolve and grow and so on. Uh, in each of these galaxies uh, is where stars, uh, uh, star formation happens. And, we, the, and, and the evolution of, of these uh, of these stars also determines the observable properties of these galaxies. And then in even a smaller scales, we have black holes and, and feedback that actually could go back and, and affect the large scale uh, distribution of, of, uh, of the universe, right? So this is a super interesting thing because in both sides of physics, but it's also super complicated, right? Because the distribution even on large scales might depend on what happens on the very, very small scales, right? And then it's, um, well, it's an active area of, of, of research each of these subtopics, right? So, but how do it work for cosmology, right? I mean, uh, naively what you would have is, okay, we have certain cosmology that we'd like to, to try determined by, you know, the amount of primordial non-causality or curvature. We could try to run simulations that could describe the dark matter distribution and then model the baryonic physics to describe the properties of, of gas and galaxies. And, and now we have three dimensional universe that we could then, you know, you could apply the same uh, analysis tools as you apply for data, define the same statistics, power spectrums or counting voids or you know, anything you want. And then you compare them and then derive um, uh, cosmological constraints, right? But you need to do this you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of times varying the cosmology, but also all the galaxy formation physics. But if you are able to do that, then you should be able to, to have the, uh, the most comprehensive uh, interpretation of, of, um, of all these future data with potentially huge gains. And uh, that, that's, um, I mean, it's not an easy task, but that is what we, we set, uh, set, us, uh, set, um, set as our goal in, in Donostia, in San Sebastian, with, uh, with my group. This is uh, I'm going to be presenting you results from, from, from these people, uh, in particular Marcos Pejero, a postdoc, Sergio, another postdoc, Jens Stucker, uh, and Mateo Senaro, also postdocs, and then uh, Lourdes Ondaro and Giovanni Erico, two PhD students, and, you know, and an ECO is a summer student, right? So we are they are here in the northern part of Spain. It's, a, it's, a, it's an, an institute called the IPC that, well, uh, recently, uh, decided to expand uh, its areas to also include uh, computational cosmology. Um, okay, so, I mean, is it, uh, I guess, by now, if we argue that this, is, uh, is, um, this task is, um, is worth doing, but it's also difficult, right? So I'm gonna tell you what we have uh, achieved so far and whether we are just crazy trying to do this or whether it's a chance that it will work. So for it, we need to solve several problems on, on different areas. On one hand, we need to simulate dark matter accurately. We, uh, we need to def uh, create simulations that are efficient, robust, and accurate. We need to sample a high dimensional parameter space. And then we need to model baryonic effects. We need to model galaxy formation. And then we need to model uh, uncertainties and sample likelihoods in an efficient manner. So the first, um, First area is uh, we have put a lot of effort to, to advance the field of, of, of uh, dark matter simulations. So, I mean, as a community, I think we have uh, reached um, a point where we understand very well all the all these simulations, and uh, we different codes uh, can now agree up to one no better than one percent down to very small scales. Um, 
So, and uh, in particular for the R simulations, we, we chose numerical parameters that can allow us to, um, to reach this 1% uh, precision. And, but also we have enhanced all the simulations uh, with different tools that allow us to, to, to track the full deformation of phase space and, uh, and, the, and the full orbit of structures after they, they fall into, into halos. And, and so this allow us to, to, to follow um, galaxies uh, very accurately. Uh, so actually, I, instead of showing you a, a, no, a video of this, well, actually, this is a, a video of it. And uh, if you uh, enter in that URL, you actually, if you, with your cell phone, actually, that is, uh, then you can interact in three dimensions, in, in 360 degrees with this video. So you can actually move around with your cell phone, and then you will have a, you know, a bit of an immersive um, uh, experience uh, flying through one of these simulations. So um, yeah, so each of these simulations has a, uh, evolved roughly in like 100 billion particles. Uh, so we, we resolve all from you know, very massive galaxy clusters of 10 to the 15 solar masses down to small ones of 10 to the 10, right? much smaller than the, the, the halo where um, you know, essentially uh, where we think the satellite galaxies uh, reside. And, uh, and we run them uh, with some special features to reduce the noise on, uh, in, inherent to the simulations. But uh, each of them would take around uh, one to two million CPU hours, right? So it, they're super expensive. So we could run only four, only four of them, right? Um, so as I was telling you earlier, we, we need not four of them, but we need, uh, you know, thousands, right? Uh, thousands of them, right, or, or many cosmology. So what we do to, to solve this problem is, um, is that instead of running a full simulation, what we do is, is try to, uh, to take one of these simulations and perturb slightly the output so that it, they represent uh, a different cosmology, right? So this is what I've been showing you here. This is a distribution of, of, of dark matter halos in a full envoy simulation that took 200,000 CPU hours. And this is the prediction of, of this, uh, we call it cosmology rescaling uh, algorithm. And that took only for this case, four seconds. So it's eight orders of magnitude faster with an error of about 20 kiloparsecs, right? So it's you know, essentially smaller than a, a small dark matter halo. And we have put a lot of effort to validate this method extensively uh, for many, many different uh, properties. So, so this is great because we can take now these four simulations and now manipulate them. and make um, and predict the, the, the structure on any cosmology in a fraction of the time. So this is uh, how well it works. So this is how precisely we can predict the nonlinear power spectrum and the abundance of halos uh, for uh, cosmology, for many different cosmologies around roughly 10 sigma around Planck, including massive neutrinos and dynamical dark energy. So you see that the accuracy typically is about 1%. In the worst case scenario, it's about 2%. And uh, again, for comparison, this is the scales where currently data is analyzed, right, point one. So only this area is, is used, but now we're able to extend this more than an order of magnitude on, on to smaller scales. So we can predict the, the state of, not the nonlinear state of matter. Similarly, for the abundance of halos, we get a precision of about two, three percent. And also for comparison, the current state of the art has an accuracy of about 10 to 15 percent, right? And, and all of this, we can do it in, a, well, for these large simulations, it takes about 30 minutes. So in, you guess given a set, uh, any values of cosmological parameters and in 30 minutes, we could create kind of a new embody simulation, right? So, so this, this, this goal of sampling simul uh, cosmology through simulations becomes more feasible. Okay, but uh, we know that dark matter is not the end of the story. We have also uh, baryonic effects and galaxy formation. Right. Uh, to give you a, an example or, or a flavor of how important this is, is we could consider two types of galaxies, right? Ones uh, that are selected according to, to stellar mass, now how massive they are. This is what you know, previous surveys have done, like BOSS and Sloan. And um, so these galaxies typically live in relatively massive halos and, and satellites, they tend to be randomly distributed, not randomly distributed, but they follow like the same profile as the, as the dark matter inside the, dark, on, inside the halos and their movements are essentially random, right? So have some, some, they can be described by certain velocity dispersion. But now if we select galaxies, not according to how massive they are, but how about, uh, but um, using uh, how many stars they're forming, something that is gonna be roughly used by Euclid, for instance, right? Through emission lines or by DESI. 
we see that we, we might preferentially pick up certain different types of galaxies. Um, they tend to be on lower mass halos. Uh, they tend to be preferentially satellites, not centrals, because uh, in, in the center, um, AGM feedback and other effects uh, shut down star formation, so you, you don't have these emission lines. Uh, but, but also they tend to be in the outskirts of Kelos and with a net infall velocity, right? So that is because after, soon after they fall in, ramp pressure and other physical processes strip them of their cold gas, and then soon after they fall, they, they stop forming stars, right? stars. That's why you typically we detect them with an infall velocity, right? Whereas for stellar mass selected, they have a zero net velocity, right? Just velocity dispersion. So more quantitatively here, I, I plot the clustering of these two types of galaxies compared to the dark matter. We see that on large scales, they, they, they trace the underlying dark matter field in, a, you know, in the same way, but on a small scales, smaller than maybe 40, 50 uh, megaparsecs, they are really very different, right? So we need to take that into account. So, so, so from our simulations, we can take different paths. So what we have uh, pushed forward is what we call an extended subhale abundance matching. Uh, so on the basic idea is, is we take the structures in our dark matter simulations and we assume a connection between the depth of the potential well and the amount of stars that a galaxy has formed. And we enhance this with different recipes to, to model how stars are stripped uh, due to tidal forces. Uh, we have tracked also galaxies after they even have lost their dark matter host. Uh, we have also extended them to, to predict the, um, the star formation rate of, this, um, of these galaxies and, and also with a tunable degree of environmental dependency. It's called assembly bias, right? So, so we have all these parameters that control galaxy formation in our simulations. So and then we can predict what the galaxies would look like um, if they had been with a stellar mass selection or a star formation rate selection. Right? So then you can see here also they, they I was telling you earlier that galaxies, satellite galaxies behave differently, but also they trace the cosmic web on a larger pattern uh, differently. So and the cool thing that we can do this is that each of these models might take you know, a few minutes. So we can start varying uh, the galaxy formation recipes and see how the in this case, the clustering of galaxies as a function of scale behaves. For instance, uh, if we if if we make if we delay the merger time scale, right? So once a galaxy falls, there is a eventually it's going to merge with the center the cent, um, with the central galaxy. But how fast this happens is a bit uncertain. So we can actually model it and see that if the merger time scale is very long, galaxies tend to cluster a lot in dark matter halos, and that's why the, the amplitude here is higher. But if the time, uh, merger time scale is short, they quickly will, will merge to the, to the central galaxy. So then we, the clustering will actually be, be small. Uh, for comparison, this is the, the, the dashed line is the, is the galaxies in, the, in one of hadronamic simulations, the illustrious TNG. Uh, so we can do the same that we did for the merger time scale, but also with the amount of strippings or the scatter between uh, dark matter and, and stars. And we have put a lot of effort to validating this. Um, semi-empirical uh, galaxy formation model uh, in redshift space, also including velocities uh, in higher order correlation functions and, and other statistics and for different selection criteria. So this is, looks great, right? I mean, if you, if, um, so if you have a galaxy selection that, that you can mimic in your simulation, then you can, um, you know, you could apply this model and, and uh, start inferring cosmology and galaxy formation. But the problem is that this is this might not be the case, right? So future surveys they have complicated galaxy selections and, and um, uh, something that you might not even be able to reproduce here. Right? So we have a, taken also a, a complementary uh, approach, a more agnostic approach that borrows from um, perturbative descriptions of galaxy bias. So some parts of of, of this uh, analytic perturbation theory I was describing you earlier, where we describe the galaxy uh, over densities. Uh, as a linear combination of different fields of this, uh, that one that depends on density, other that depends on the square of the density, or that depends on the shear or tidal field, and also the Laplacian of the fields. So this, this would correspond to more technically uh, like a first uh, one loop expansion of galaxy bias in perturbation theory. So we can, uh, we can write this, but instead of assuming that all these fields are given by perturbation theory as you know, normally done, we can compute them directly from the from uh, our numerical simulations. 
So this um, this actually is, uh, turns out to be super um, accurate. So this is uh, this is how it works. Uh, so this is these are the measurements of the galaxy power spectrum in symbols selected according to star formation rate uh, and their cross correlation with dark matter. And the blue line is the best fitting description of our model. And uh, so you see that there essentially is, is a perfect description all the way up to you know, these small scales where essentially discreteness noise kicks in. And here we actually we quantify with respect to the statistical uncertainty that you expect for Euclid. You can see that it's on all scales is is uh, is about uh, well, it's statistically compatible, which means that this might offer you a, a a way of analyzing all all the range of scales that Euclid will measure. Right. I mean, again, for comparison, uh, linear theory just stops being valid around this scale, and this higher order perturbation theory, maybe in point fifteen or maybe going to the most optimistic case. So we have validated this um, not only for one case, but we have run thousands of different uh, galaxy formation models varying the, what I was saying earlier, the efficiency of star formation and so on. And, and, and we have shown that this method fits all of them very accurately. And, and it's quite interesting that also these various parameters are not um, in, independent, but there seem to be tight relations between uh, between them, right? So this is a, the the coefficient that multiplies the shear field as a function of the one that multiplies the density. Right? So you see that there is that relatively tight relations and not completely free. So that would actually could be even could deliver even a stronger constraints and from future data. Okay, so we I've discussed how to model dark matter galaxies. Now we have to move to baryons, right? So we know that baryonic effects and uh, cooling of gas, uh, gene feedback can change the distribution of galaxies on large scales. Um, so this can have um, implications for for uh, the expected gravitational lensing signal that you that you, that you should have in, um, for instance, in you know in dark matter survey or other surveys. And in particular, what seems to happen is that with uh, with all these processes, the amount of clustering that you expect is smaller than uh, if you have only considered gravity. But this is not a unique prediction. Different simulations might predict different degrees of, of, of this suppression. Some of them, you know, 30%, some others a little bit of an enhancement. And also the scaling, which this happens is also, uh, you know, can also vary quite a lot, right? From happening on K of one to, to an order of magnitude smaller scales uh, for, for the Horizon AGN. Right, so how do, we, how do we deal with this, right? And do we need to run thousands of different simulations? That, uh, that is actually super difficult, maybe it's, it's, it's doable, but so we have followed a different approach uh, also connected to this uh, semi-empirical uh, description of, of astrophysics. So what we decided to do was to, to say, okay, let's describe uh, the variance in a given dark matter halo as, uh, as a contribution of five different uh, components, right? Once you have dark matter, but also you have gas that is in bound, you know, could be bound, so it's in hydrostatic equilibrium. You have stars clustered in the center, and then you have also a gas that's being ejected uh, from or prevented from accretion, from accretion that can extend even you know few times the real radius. So, and the basic idea is that you now instead of taking this um, as given, um, we parameterize them. Uh, for instance, if the gas is described by the ejected gas is described by how much it is and how how far it typically reaches from the halo, right? And then uh, we can go, now we have a model that then we can perturb the positions of dark matter in gravity only simulations according to this, uh, to this description. Uh, so how well does it work? Uh, it turns out that it works super well. So we have tested this in a couple of uh, papers with my PhD student, Giovanni. Uh, and here I show you the suppression in this by variance for six state-of-the-art hydrodynamic simulation that predict very different suppressions. Um, the solid line is, uh, well, this dash and solid this is our, um, our model. So you see that you can describe all the cases super well, roughly about 1% accurate, accurately. But it does not only describe the power spectrum, but also describe the actual deformation of matter in space. For instance, here we quantify whether it's also this model also reproduces the changes of variance to the uh, three-point functions, right, the bispectrum. Uh, so also that depends on not only on, on the amplitude of fluctuations on the scales, but also how they are arranged in space. And we can see that uh, this, for instance, these um, solid lines describe, describe things very well 
simultaneously the power spectrum, the by spectrum in this case, and the power spectrum, right? So, and, uh, so you can actually, this allows us to describe the baryonic effects in a very flexible way uh, without having to rely on any specific paradigmatic simulation. Although these three parameters can be informed by simulations or by um, observations, right? You can put priors and what is reasonable and what is not. So again, this also takes about um, you know, 30 minutes or so. Uh, so, so, if, so, um, so it's actually it's relatively fast, but we have a problem, right? Because um, you know, even though I was telling you all these steps uh, can uh, describe um, uh, you know, observables in a relatively short amount of time, maybe you know, it takes about two hours to do everything, it's still uh, unfeasible to, do, to, do, to put this in a, in a parameter estimation, estimation um, uh, pipeline, right? Where you need to evaluate hundreds of thousands on, of different parameters, right? So, um, and also we need to propagate all the uncertainties of this modeling into the final procedures on your on omega matter and other parameters. So what we did was uh, to combine all the power of the simulations with, um, with uh, fed forward neural networks. So the basic idea that we're following is that we take our, our, um, our, our parameter space, like the omega matter, sigma eight, uh, star formation efficiency and, and uh, you know, the extent of gas ejection, and we pre-compute um, uh, these this results uh, for in a grid of, of uh, roughly about 10,000 points. And then we, we use those uh, to train a neural network. So it can learn how to make predictions for, for any speci specific statistics, right? For instance, the correlation function. So then, and this, the key advantage is that these networks are, can adapt easily to, to these very complex trends and also can be super fast to evaluate, right? So they might take uh, about one microsecond or so. So we have uh, built uh, networks for the nonlinear matter power spectrum, for the impact of baryons, for galaxy correlation functions, for the halo mass function, also for perturbative descriptions of the bias. And then um, actually uh, you can use all this framework, not only in this context, but we have recently applied also to speed up um, linear perturbation theory. Right, so something that you could do with class or cam in a matter of seconds is super fast. But when you run a chain, that might take again like ten or maybe 20, 30 hours. Right, but we what we did recently was to train um, one of the neural networks on on this power spectrum. So now you can evaluate you know the linear power spectrum in in a microsecond. So you can do um, a standard analysis in a matter of minutes. Um, okay, so now we have this. Uh, of the, the first uh, pipeline, so we can go back to and, and, and see how it would work together. So for this test, we just took the correlation function of the galaxies uh, in the illustrious TNG dynamic simulations. So this is what is shown here in, in real space, so only distribution of galaxies or also in creating velocities here in virtual space. So, so for each of, um, no, so then we, we have, this is our, our data and now we, we, took, we, we predict um, the dark matter, we predict galaxies and the statistics, and we fit, you know, we iterate for, uh, with a livelihood um, sampler. And these are the, the, the constraints. So first, the first, the best fitting model is shown here in, in, in red. So you basically cannot see the difference with respect to the, these galaxies. The only difference is that here we are, you know, takes a, a few seconds and, um, and uh, also by cosmology. So now we have well, here we show the, the posteriors uh, on this on, on parameters. So we vary seven, in this case two galaxy formation parameters and two cosmological parameters. Sorry, three galaxy formation parameters. The scatter between uh, dark matter and galaxies, the merger time scale, and the and the strength of the of tidal stripping. And for cosmology, we vary the sig sigma eight and omega mat. So you see that um, now we can have cosmological parameters that uh, that uh, have like several advantages. Uh, one of them is that we can use even like very, very small scales, like super nonlinear scales below like one megaparsec, like in intra halo velocity uh, scales. But also we can have more robust constraints because the, or constraints for instance on sigma eight uh, are derived after marginalization of our galaxy formation physics. So I think also that allows us to, to have 
also more robust uh, constraints and would allow us to perhaps identify which areas are, are more is important to improve in the future or what physics is most important to, to, to understand to improve also cosmological constraints. But uh, I think one of, but perhaps even the um, uh, even more exciting opportunity is that we are, yeah, in, in this framework, we're not only developing uh, one particular summary statistics, but we're creating three-dimensional universes. So we can project these universes uh, on different dimensions to simultaneously predict different observables. For instance, we can take our dark matter and project it uh, and we, we um, and you know and predict the distribution of, of uh, or the properties of, of lensing. Or we can take our galaxies and predict galaxy clustering, or take the baryons and extend it with some thermodynamic, thermodynamical uh, relations to predict the Sun Yatsen or other, other quantities. But also we can take dark matter around galaxies to predict galaxy galaxy lensing that will, uh, or dark matter and baryons to predict, uh, to predict the thermal C uh, lensing cross correlations or um, identify clusters um, and, and look at the galaxy around it to do also maybe X-ray uh, galaxy abundance and cross correlations and all of these in a, in a self-consistent way, right? So the, the baryonic physics that would affect the Sunyat-Seldovic is also affecting the, the lensing. So, so um, uh, I think this could be quite, uh, quite interesting in the future where we have all this multi-wavelength data. So, um, that we can start constraining uh, or having more a holistic view of, of cosmology where we, we have the same universe that is constrained in different aspects by, by different data. And uh, of course, as we understand more and more about galaxy formation, we can, or, or dynamics, uh, we can always um, use that to, to return uh, you know, uh, even stronger cosmological constraints. Okay, so um, go to my summary slide. Um, so I think in, uh, I try to, to, to tell you that um, I think cosmology is in a very exciting uh, place right now and there's going to be a lot of new data but and that that is that gives us this opportunity to learn about the universe but also it's quite challenging from the data analysis point of view and then how to make um, uh, theoretical predictions but a simula uh, simulation based approach where we try to describe the universe, different aspects of the universe in a self-consistent manner may uh, offer a, a, a good way to interpret this data that could uh, eventually um, deliver uh, a very accurate uh, and robust uh, path towards uh, you know, new physics perhaps. Um, yeah, and also if you're interested, we have this website where we have made um, all of our, uh, emulators and, and neural network, trained neural networks publicly available and we're gonna also be putting um, our, um, our simulations and, and catalogs for, uh, for anybody that is interested. So yeah, so thank you very much for, for, for listening. Thanks, uh, lovely talk, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm not in the field, so I learned a lot. Um, I have a question on, um, when you discuss it, you, you can run a limited number of simulations, uh, but then you can perturb the output in a simulation to obtain a different cosmology, if understood correctly. But so how does, the per if you can explain it very you know, rapidly, if it's too complicated, I will just read the papers, but how does the perturbation actually capture a specific cosmology rather than you know, a, you know, a stochastic process? Uh, so so you're you're asking exactly how how this cosmology rescaling works, or, or yes, how uh, how you know that the given perturbation would give rise to a specific okay. cosmology that you want? Right. Um, so we so the method itself takes a um, couple of ansatz essentially uh, on large scales. What we what we do is um, is take you know for instance your distribution of, of galaxies. And, and now we want to, for instance, change the value of, uh, of omega matter, right? Um, so we need to predict how, how much a galaxy would have moved if omega matter was different. So on that displacement, we predict with, uh, with Lagrangian perturbation theory, right? Oh. Order, right? So, so we go and we say, okay, maybe perturbation theory is not accurate to describe the full nonlinear displacement, but it's actually more accurate to describe relative displacements. And then, um, and the way that we, we test this is by then running another simulation 
directly adopting the parameters our target parameters, right? So we wanted to move from omega matter 0.2 to 0.3. We applied our procedure and then we compare against the simulation directly run with omega matter 0.3. So we can actually do like one-to-one -one comparison. Okay. And that's how we we can say that the method is accurate at the you know, one, two percent level. Thank you. That was very clear. Thank you. Guillaume, please. Hi, Raoul. Uh, yeah, just uh, one comment on the, uh, so you had like an expansion in uh, in bias and um, I think there is also a lot of work by uh, Fabian Schmidt group on this. I uh, would like to know if you have like any comments on that. So if, how do you fare? What's the, uh... Right. So so what Fabian is doing is, I mean, essentially the, the bias expansion that I provided is what, you know, what essentially everybody working on, on analytic descriptions of, of galaxy from, uh, clustering adopts, so it's just a one loop expansion. Uh, and then what Fabian does is, uh, is you start from your initial conditions, like here, here you redshift, and then you compute uh, the displacement field uh, using, well, in this case, case, use like 30 or well, NLPT, right? Very high order Lagrangian perturbation theory. And he kind of can move the, your galaxies from you know, redshift 1000 to redshift zero. So what we are doing is instead of displacing them with you know, high order Lagrangian perturbation theory from redshift 100 to zero, we displace them using n-body simulations. So we have fully nonlinear displacements, whereas he has only like per perturbative displacements. Yeah, no, they, okay, uh, yeah, so he's doing this at the second order, but uh, so the point is that this bias is supposed to be, um, I mean, the bias expansion is supposed to be Kept consistent at second order, so they capture weak equivalence principle. But, uh, right. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I would say it's just, I mean, you could imagine the same framework. It's just mm -hmm. instead of having to describe perturbatively delta squared, mm -hmm. we get it uh, with the simulations, right? So okay. Yeah. So it um, has that advantage, right? So so that we uh, we only keep the bias perturbatively. The bias is perturbative, but the displacements are. Uh, simulated, and that seems to give a huge gain, right? Uh, so if you don't do this, you you, know, you find that you get a good description, you know, up to k of maybe 0. 0.15 or so. Whereas in this case, we get correctly up to 0. 0.8, right? So five times uh, smaller scales. And this is quite important because the amount of information you can imagine scales like the minimum scale to the cube, right? So going from 0.15 to 0.8 is more than 100 times more information. Yeah, I mean, we can we can discuss after. <laughs> what is it that you want to discuss, Guillaume? I mean, yeah, is there a point that is worth uh, yeah, no, the, the, it's at the two, at the moment, it's uh, it's two point statistics as far as I understand with Raul. I mean, the, uh, the, yeah, the, for Fabian, he wants to go like beyond the two point. Sure, yeah, yeah, everybody. So at the moment what we have published is only two point functions. So we are working on extending and in real space. So we are working on extensions to rich space and to higher order. Yeah. So did I understood properly uh, that the improvement versus the perturbative treatment by doing the displacement uh, numerically has only been validated on the two point function? And in real space, yeah. I mean, it was a paper we put out. Okay, like, thanks. I mean, no, it's, it's it's very clear. Okay, thanks a lot. Gary, please. Okay, thank you very much, Raoul. Uh, this was a uh, very very impressive to me what you showed, and uh, with uh, wide uh, with very um, important applications. So now I know why we talked about BACO yesterday at the Euclid meeting. <laughs> and um, um, so I, I had an, I was intrigued by the last plot you were showing where you were trying to reproduce uh, the TNG simulation parameters, uh, cosmological parameters, not knowing the physics uh, and trying to predict it. And I noticed in your plot that if you correlated the the astrophysical quantities with the cosmological quantities, one of them, which I didn't understand what it was, had showed correlations with the cosmological properties. It was Fs. And so, so, um, 
so my first question is what is FS and then my more general question is, of course, and of course you probably cannot answer yet, but uh, I guess your goal is to make predictions for different surveys, such as Euclid and others, of how well they will be able to reproduce the cosmological param parameters given the uncertainties we have on the astrophysics. So I'll be interested in, in, in hearing what yeah. you think about that. Yeah, exactly. That is uh, that is uh, our next uh, point in the in our uh, no, in our program. Um, so so yeah, so uh, FS um, is is a is a parameter that controls how much uh, stripping of stars happens uh, after okay. a galaxy falls into a larger halo. So um, uh, so and the way that you can think that is there is correlation is that you don't know whether a halo has fewer galaxies because they very quickly get stripped and then you have less uh, ones, or maybe it was because uh, uh, it uh, the halo is a little bit less massive and therefore you host uh, less, uh, so less massive uh, galaxies and fewer of them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there is the, there is this regeneracies that, I mean, are li they, are, they are partially broken when you start using the small scales, but we are, we're still investigating well all these and, and, and the way we are doing this is yeah trying to see whether we could reproduce the illustrious TNG without knowing the physics or the cosmology, but we can re recover the correct cosmology, how accurately, and whether all the small all the additional uh, scales that we are using for constraining these parameters really improve the cosmological constraints or they just uh, constrain the values of these astrophysical parameters. I think it's, this is something that I, mean, I think the field is currently unknown. Whether uh, whether astrophysics is and nonlinearities are so complicated that they erase all the primordial information, and the only thing you're constraining is astrophysics, or whether there is something um, rem no, something left there. Um, and yes, yeah, so once we have all this uh, this ready, then yeah, we would like to know how much better Euclid can actually do. For instance, uh, yeah. no, is it going to do a factor of two, or, or maybe a race is already close to optimal? We, yeah, we still don't so know. you think within a year you may be able to provide some answers on that second? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Let me go back to the stripping of stars. One can try to estimate this directly by comparing observations and then body only simulations using a, a, a halo abundance matching and sub halo abundance matching, at least a little wretched. So Andrea Cataneo, uh, Edouard Tollet, and myself, had, uh, had, and, and uh, Frank Vandenbosch, we have a paper on that. And um, so in a way that can help because we make no assumptions in the baryonic physics, we don't need to. Yeah, I think that, that's a super interesting way, uh, way of thinking about it, that, um, that, that we are using the clustering to, to get some of the information on this, but then you can put priors from other observations. Right? Mm -hmm. So you can uh, also in terms of the baryons from uh, no, X-ray, uh, um, you can get constraints on the baryon fraction, right? And, and you can put some priors, and then yes. uh, and the cool thing is that you can propagate this in a self-consistent way, right? You need to assume one value, but you say, oh, within the statistics, we know that this is, and then you just take this as, as a external data set, right? And then um, and then you can also identify maybe which observations are actually needed the most. Maybe if FS, for instance, is is the most um, degenerate parameter with cosmology, maybe we should think from brainstorm of ways of independently measuring that. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's super so interesting. So in your modeling, you can, um, you can think of all these different observational diagnostics and you mentioned plenty of them. Uh, you mentioned at least a dozen of them. And so the more you add, the better it is. But then of course, there's the issue of uh, how independent are they, you know, um, but uh, for the statistical yeah. modeling. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. You have to do covariances and all that. Right? But, yeah, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think we're, uh, at least might open these possibilities. Uh, and you know, I guess we still don't know whether they will actually help at the end or not, but at least gives you that, that opportunity that of, uh, of freeing yourself, I think, from, uh, from, from these kind of analytic descriptions. We can actually have a simulated universe and then, uh, and then try to do the best we can with it rather than just only focus on things that you can describe perturbatively as it's done yes. now. No, thank you very much, Raul. That was great. No, thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the in the chat in the chat room. Uh, so we should stop here uh, at least for the. Record.